A genuine flattening of the curve. The government's response as Australian COVID-19 infections fall below 1% for a week. Spain's horrendous death toll, now 20,000. But the Prime Minister promises children they will soon breathe fresh air. The Australian-born physician who stopped coronavirus in its tracks in Greece. How he won the hearts and trust of the people. And rocking in the lounge room, the music superstars coming together to unite the world in the global fight against COVID-19. This is SBS World News with Janice Peterson. Good evening. An important national achievement. That's how the government is describing a week-long fall in the rate of new coronavirus infections. The Health Minister calling it a genuine flattening of the curve. Greg Hunt is also suggesting elective surgery could resume as early as next week after the government secured a supply of tens of millions of face masks. In other developments, Australia calls into question China's transparency over the pandemic. Fines for spitting and coughing at health workers to be extended to all essential staff. The death toll in Spain now exceeds 20,000. Turkey becomes the new epicentre of coronavirus in the Middle East. Globally, just over 2.3 million coronavirus cases have been reported. More than 160,000 people have died. In Australia, two deaths have been reported today, with the death toll now 72. Of the 184 people being treated in hospital, 55 are in intensive care. But first, why the government is calling the reduction in coronavirus cases here in Australia a national achievement. It was a major factor in the decision to stop elective and non-essential operations, with the government receiving 58 million masks now and securing another 100 million for the national stockpile, surgery may soon be in session. We're hopeful that over the course of this week uh, there will be some positive news and today is about building that capacity and laying the foundations for the road out. Cancellations came in last month amid fears coronavirus patients would overwhelm hospitals and supplies. But the Health Minister is optimistic the National Cabinet will agree to resume elective surgeries and IVF this week, as he says Australia is winning the war against COVID-19, with infection rates at an all-time low. The rate of increase in new cases has been below 1% for seven consecutive days now, and that's an important national achievement. What it means is we now have a sustained and genuine flattening of the curve. But he says more work needs to be done as the country enters flu season. The federal government taking measures to prevent a so-called double whammy, boosting production of seasonal flu shots. You really don't want to be in a situation where you're fighting off the coronavirus as well as uh, a regular flu when you can be protected against the flu. Manufacturers of the vaccine working to add an additional 3 million doses to a record 16.5 million this year. So we've gone back into production now, so they'll start to roll out throughout May and June. Most Australians have to pay for their flu shots, but government subsidies are in place for those aged 65 and over, children five years old and younger, pregnant women, those with chronic medical conditions and all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people over six months. The federal government adding an extra line of defence for the elderly, mandating from May 1 all aged care workers and visitors must be vaccinated. It's hoped that weeks of social distancing, hand washing and isolating the medically vulnerable will make this flu season a quiet one. The GPs want the vaccines rolled out as quickly as possible to ensure the public is protected before winter. The flu vaccinations are, are there, they just need to be distributed and what we're saying to the state and territory, territory governments is really Let's get them out there and let's get them out now. Since March, more than 2.1 million Australians have received the flu vaccine, more than triple the number from this time last year. Abby Dinham, SBS World News. The Australian government is calling for an independent global review into the origins and spread of COVID-19. The nation's top diplomat revealing she has very high concerns about China's transparency during the deadly pandemic. 
A world in turmoil as nations and their citizens fight first for survival and then the truth. And I do think relationships between uh, China and its partners, Australia and China, will be changed in some ways. Foreign Minister Maurice Payne calling for an independent global investigation into COVID-19. About the genesis of, uh, of the virus, about the appro approaches to dealing with it and addressing with it, about the openness with which information was shared. A move backed by the shadow foreign minister. The world wants to understand the origin of COVID-19 and the world is entitled to understand that. Both agree any investigation we must be independent of the World Health Organization. Criticised for its delay in declaring a global pandemic, tweeting in January, preliminary investigations conducted by the Chinese authorities have found no clear evidence of human-to-human -human transmission. What we saw from some officials in Geneva we think was a response which didn't help the world. Maurice Payne confirming her Chinese counterpart Wang Yi told her in January the coronavirus was generally preventable, controllable and curable. I don't think that I can speak for what he really thought at the time. Relations further strained after an Australian aid flight was unable to land in Vanuatu after last week's cyclone. Despite having landing approval, the Globemaster was forced to circle back to Australia and return the following day because a Chinese aircraft was blocking the runway. My trust in China is uh, predicated in the long-term relationship. My concern about these issues issues though uh, is is at a very high point my concern is around transparency but do you trust China uh, I trust China in terms of the work that we need to do together transparency and openness are the basis of trust uh, the world wants to be able to trust China China wants the world to be able to trust it the Chinese Embassy did not respond to our questions about Beijing's willingness to participate in an independent international inquiry just last week its diplomats accused some Australian politicians of spreading fallacies not facts. Well, look, obviously uh, the geopolitical sphere is very complex and it's unravelling as we speak at the moment. Adding yet another layer of complexity to Australia's most challenging diplomatic relationship. And Chief Political Correspondent Brett Mason joins us now live from Canberra. Good evening, Brett. The debate, of course, continues about the government's plans for a coronavirus tracing app. Well, Janice, even the mere suggestion that the government's tracing app could be compulsory has infuriated coalition MPs and senators. Scott Morrison was asked about this on Friday and didn't rule out the fact that that application on people's smartphones could be mandatory. We know that several senators and MPs immediately contacted his office to complain, among them former Deputy Prime Minister Barnaby Joyce. I don't want the government in every corner of my life. I mean, my house has curtains, not because we're committing crimes, because we want to have privacy. As the government tries to deal with the COVID-19 crisis, tomorrow a former Prime Minister releases his memoir. Malcolm Turnbull's book has already been widely reported and as some Liberals move to have the former Prime Minister banned from the Liberal Party for life for some of the revelations inside that 600-page book, today his publisher's lawyers were contacting a senior staff member in the current Prime Minister's office. It's been revealed and advisor to Scott Morrison received an unauthorised digital copy and then forwarded that along to dozens of what we've been told are his acquaintances. The lawyers for Malcolm Turnbull have effectively told the Prime Minister staff to stop doing that. They are in breach of copyright. And one of those who has confirmed that she received a copy is the Foreign Minister, Maurice Payne. Let's take a listen. Did it come from the Prime Minister's office? This is the suggestion from Absolutely the publisher. Absolutely not. OK, who did it come from? Uh, David, I've received and deleted. That's the most important thing. You won't tell us who it's come from? Received and deleted, David. I'll take that as a no answer. I think we will. Foreign Minister Maurice Payne, thank you for joining us. 
received and deleted, says the Foreign Minister. Received and devoured, other colleagues told me today. Janice, expect there will be uh, many more conversations about Malcolm Turnbull's Prime Ministership in the coming days. Yeah, that won't be going away in a hurry. Thanks so much. Brett Mason updating us from Canberra. While Australia is raising questions about China's transparency, US President Donald Trump has also stepped up his criticism. He's warned China could face consequences if it was knowingly responsible for the coronavirus pandemic. There are now more than 735,000 confirmed cases in the US. That's well over half a million more infections than any other country. More than 39,000 people have died. At the White House, President Trump focused on China. You know, the question was asked, would you be angry at China? Well, the answer might very well be a very resounding yes, but it depends. Was it a mistake that got out of control or was it done deliberately? White House Task Force member Dr. Deborah Burks, diplomatic but pointed. When you are the first country to have an outbreak, you really have a moral obligation to the world to not only talk about it, but provide that information that's critical to the rest of the world. The early response to the crisis, not merely a question of history, it is rapidly becoming the election issue. The Democrats' presumptive presidential candidate launching this ad. I would be on the phone with China and making it clear, we are going to need to be in your country. We have to know what's going on. But Trump rolled over for the Chinese. Mr Trump in turn tweeting, China wants Sleepy Joes so badly, their dream candidate. As Dr. Burks discussed mortality rates for other countries, official Chinese data showing it has the lowest proportion, the president cutting in. Does anybody really believe this number? The numbers from the viral epicenter in the United States, the best in two weeks, but still devastating. And the worst news is still tragic news, number of deaths, 540. Uh, it's not as high as it was, but still 540 people died yesterday. Both Governor Cuomo and New York City's mayor imploring Washington to facilitate mass testing. We can't make testing appear out of thin air. Uh, the federal government is supposed to marshal the resources of this country. Across the country, families with no resources, hundreds queuing in Maryland at a supermarket giveaway. In Florida, glimpses of how life used to be, Jacksonville reopening its beach. Frustration growing in the Midwest. Those demands that state governors lift stay-at-home restrictions, again finding support from the president. There are a lot of protests out there, and uh, I, I just think that some of the governors have gotten carried away. Texas, one of three states, planning a limited reopening this week, but that's not quick enough for radio host Alex Jones. The conspiracy theorist who was recently warned by federal authorities to stop spruiking bogus COVID-19 treatments on his show. Through the one SBS World News. Spain's Prime Minister has moved to extend his country's coronavirus lockdown, but says he'll soon start to ease what are some of Europe's toughest restrictions. The number of people who have died due to COVID-19 in Spain has now surpassed 20,000 people, the third country in the world to reach that milestone. But the death and infection rate is continuing to slow down. Spain's capital, Madrid, the epicentre of the country's coronavirus outbreak, seen from the skies to be strictly observing its nationwide shutdown. Its picturesque boulevards and landmarks deserted, its streets empty. Citizens can only leave their homes by themselves and only for absolute necessities. And while the lockdown has seen the death and infection rates drop, the numbers are still frightening. 565 Spaniards dying yesterday alone. We continue to have a significant number of deaths. This is not over yet. We have to understand that what we cannot in any way do is throw out all the effort that we've been making. Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez wants the state of emergency that was due to end on April 26 extended a further 15 days. 
but some measures will be relaxed slightly, firstly for children. Therefore, from the 27th of April, the government of Spain will take relief measures for deconfinement, if I may use the expression, of our little ones, so that they can go out and, as a consequence, enjoy those improvements that we are seeing numerically in the evolution of the pandemic. Spain's improving situation underlined by the closure of this makeshift coronavirus hospital in Madrid. A glimmer of light at the end of a long tunnel as the final patient was declared COVID-free. In Germany, 24 hours after declaring it had the situation under control, today reporting 2,500 new cases and 184 deaths. In the United Kingdom, where deaths have topped 15,000, with 900 reported in the last 24 hours, personal protective equipment continues to be in short supply. And the alternatives, like thin plastic aprons when gowns run out, are increasing the concerns of medical staff, who fear they may now be even more exposed to infection. 84 tonnes of PPE is due to arrive tomorrow from Turkey. And I can absolutely assure you uh, that for me and my clinical colleagues, this is very personal. Uh, these are my friends, these are my colleagues, uh, these are some of my extended family. A deeply personal time during a profoundly religious period. At Moscow's largest cathedral, the Orthodox Easter service was streamed to housebound worshippers on a day that Russia recorded its largest daily increase in infections. Almost 40,000 Russians now have the virus. Omar Dehen, SBS World News. Coming up next, retail workers exposed to repulsive acts. Moves to extend protections for frontline staff. Also why Greeks believe the work of an Australian-born physician has helped spare them from the worst of COVID-19. And learning for preschoolers when the kids have the go-ahead for lots of screen time. A second man has died at an aged care home in Western Sydney at the centre of a coronavirus outbreak sparked by a nurse who showed no symptoms. Federal health officials today urged all healthcare workers to be extra vigilant, while authorities are cracking down on widespread abuse of retail and transport workers. Sharon Herringe says she's still in shock after being spat on by a customer at the coal supermarket she works at on the New South Wales south coast. The customer service manager was allegedly assaulted earlier this month by a woman who refused to comply with social distancing restrictions. Still in shock and disbelief that it actually happened. We're just going about our everyday jobs. We're just doing what we're getting paid to, go and do our work and we don't need this kind of aggression. From tomorrow, retail staff in New South Wales will be given stronger protections with a $5,000 on-the-spot fine for spitting or coughing on health workers and police, expanded to include all other essential workers. To those hopefully few people who still think this is an acceptable practice, the police are open to giving you a $5,000 fine. The move welcomed by the retail union. It's unfortunate that we need a law like this but we do. Just in the last week, I've had four matters raised with me by members. And attacks on bus, train and tram drivers rose by 40% last month. It's a daily occurrence anyway. It's a shame that it's taken such awful circumstances for this to come into place. The tough new measures comes as health officials continue to manage several outbreaks of COVID-19. 21 new cases were recorded in New South Wales, including nine more at this aged care home in Western Sydney, where a 94-year-old man died this morning after the death of a 93-year-old man yesterday. More than a quarter of residents there have now caught the virus from a staff member who unknowingly passed it on. Increasingly we're concerned about people being infectious before onset of symptoms and so it is going to be a challenge in terms of keeping it COVID out of our aged care facilities in general. Frontline healthcare workers again urge to be extremely vigilant. Because that's how we're going to protect those most vulnerable in our community 
from this um, pandemic as we go forward. And in Victoria, a man in his 80s has died after contracting COVID-19, taking the state's death toll to 15. Premier Daniel Andrews says while the infection rate has dropped, it's still too soon to relax restrictions. It's frustrating, uh, but it's certainly less frustrating than if you look at what occurred in northwest Tasmania last week. No criticism of uh, Tasmania, they handled it very well, but this can get away from you very, very rapidly. The Premier also stressing the suppression strategy approved by National Cabinet is working. Cassandra Bain, SBS World News. The Prime Minister of Greece says his country is no longer the black sheep of Europe, given its impressive control of the coronavirus. Greece, which implemented one of the earliest and strictest lockdowns in Europe, has just recorded over 2,000 cases and 110 deaths. That's much lower than its EU counterparts. Many attribute the country's success to one man, the Chief Medical Officer, Sotiris Tsiodras an Australian-born professor who's won the hearts and trust of the Greek people. This is what Orthodox Easter celebrations usually look like in Greece. <laughs> this year looked very different. With the country in strict lockdown, Easter services went without worshippers and family gatherings were all but forbidden. For a nation that is 98% Greek Orthodox, convincing the public to obey such rules is no easy feat. But the citizens of Greece have been, somewhat surprisingly, obedient. Efforts largely attributed to this man, Greece's chief medical officer, Australian-born Professor Sotiros Sodras. Addressing the nation every night at 6pm, he uses his unassuming but frank manner to rally the country behind some of the strictest measures in Europe. Both the level of mortality and the rate of its increase in our country seem favourable compared to other countries at the moment, but this should in no way lead to complacency. Born in Sydney, Mr Siodras went on to study in Greece and Harvard, where he became a highly successful epidemiologist. Despite consulting the Greek government on malaria and bird flu outbreaks, he was largely unknown before the coronavirus pandemic began. But his dedicated, humble leadership during the crisis has earned him an adoring following. With the financial crisis and all of that, they've lost a lot of faith in their politicians. So with Mr Chodras, they, they found a person that they can have faith in, that they can believe in, and that's something that they really, they, they desperately need. Greece has controversially locked down an entire Roma settlement, but Mr Siodras has won praise for calling on his fellow countrymen not to demonise the community. He's also won over hearts by letting his controlled demeanour slip on occasion. <laughs> The 54-year-old father of seven was voted the most popular person in Greece in a recent TV poll. Amelia Dunn, SBS World News. A tip-off by New Caledonian police led to a pre-dawn raid and the seizure of hundreds of kilograms of drugs from a yacht off Australia. The high seas drug bust coming up shortly. Turkey has become the COVID-19 epicentre of the Middle East, with the number of cases there surpassing Iran's official figures. Iran is easing restrictions, partially reopening Tehran as coronavirus deaths hit a one-month low of 73. But in Turkey, more than 82,000 infections have been confirmed, with 3,800 cases diagnosed in the past 24 hours. It's an age-old crossroads where Europe meets Asia. But the pandemic that shut down China and engulfed the world has now hit here with a vengeance. Istanbul is empty and under lockdown. More pigeons than people. The famous Blue Mosque. Deserted. The only people to be seen, heavily armed, locked down in forces. For a second weekend, restrictions are in place across 31 cities, including Istanbul and the capital, Ankara and controls are tightening. People under 20 and over 65 are being told to stay at home. Turkey's health minister has tweeted out this video. In reassuring tones, it says Turkey will tomorrow open up part of one of Europe's largest intensive care facilities. It's still under construction, but will soon be full. 
Iran says the worst is over and it's time to focus on reigniting the economy. Shops, factories and workshops can now resume operations. But Ramadan later this month will be different to normal. Iranians told to stay home to eat and pray. Israel is also easing some of its tight restrictions in what the Prime Minister has called a responsible and gradual way. Israelis will now be allowed to venture 500 meters from their homes. Open-air prayers in groups of ten will also be permitted. But in Jerusalem's Holy Sepulchre, thousands of Orthodox Christians were forced to stay away from one of their most ancient rituals at the tomb of Jesus. Gary Cox, SBS World News. And these are the latest developments in the COVID-19 pandemic, both here and around the world. Australia calls into question China's transparency over the pandemic. Fines for spitting and coughing at healthcare workers to be extended to all essential staff. The death toll in Spain now exceeds 20,000. Turkey becomes the new epicentre of coronavirus in the Middle East. Well, it was a concert, the likes of which the world has never seen. With billions of people across the globe forced to stay home because of the COVID-19 pandemic, some of the world's biggest stars live stream performances from their lounge rooms. The purpose of the eight-hour event was to honour healthcare workers and support the World Health Organisation.